If you thought Pope Week was big, how about the nation's 250th birthday? Inside Story starts right now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Matt O'Donnell. It is Sunday, November 24, 2024, but we're talking about sometime in the future. The year 2026 could be the biggest year the city of Philadelphia has seen since 1776. What? Now, that's a bold statement since that was when our nation was founded some, oh, wait, 250 years ago. Now we're on to something. The region is preparing for a semi-quincentennial celebration of the birth of the United States of America, a multitude of events across the city celebrating our neighborhoods, the arts, culture, science, our nation's history, and our birth as a democracy. But that is not all. Our region will also play host to a series of super consequential sporting events all in that same year of 2026 that will also showcase the Delaware Valley to the world. FIFA World Cup matches at the link, the MLB All-Star Game at the bank, the first and second rounds of March Madness at the well, the U.S. Amateur Golf Championship at Marion, the PGA Championship at Aronimic. Yes, all in one year, all around here. So we better get going. So that's why we had to call in Danielle DeLeo Kim, who is president and CEO of Philadelphia 250, which is well in the planning phase for 2026. Welcome to Inside Story. Thank you very much. All right, so Pleasure to be here. Danielle, you have the floor. Bring us the hype. Why should we be excited about this 2026? 2026 is a once in a generation opportunity for the city. Um, you said that Philadelphia is founded here, in, or the country was founded in Philadelphia in 1776. Every major anniversary, Philadelphia has played a leading role. So 1876, we hosted the Centennial Exhibition. Mm -hmm. 1926 was the Sesqui Centennial. Um, Which is hard to say, but also this hard to even say. more difficult. <laughs> yes. Uh, 17, uh, 1976 Bicentennial. So now we are coming up on a once in a generation opportunity. The last time really was the Bicentennial mm -hmm. that uh, the city and the country celebrated something like this. What's your goal? Our goal is to activate the people and the neighborhoods of Philadelphia. Get them excited. Get them excited, find ways to uh, encourage people to really get engaged in democracy. I mean, we are celebrating the 250th anniversary of democracy, and we all have a stake in that. So we want to get people excited about that. We want to celebrate the diverse neighborhoods around the city and the cultural diversity that are there, the historic gems and the places that um, we don't know enough about that we that we probably walk by every day, but we actually this is an opportunity to celebrate and get to know those places better. And then ultimately, we, we want to leave something behind that that makes a bit of a difference and really helps to move the city forward. So our goal as an organization is to activate, is to celebrate and to bring some transformations where we can. A couple challenges funding. You need funding from the city, the state, maybe the federal government. Sure. You need funding from private organizations. And then there's what's happening with SEPTA, which is going to be key in getting people around. They're talking about a deaths priority. So talk about those challenges. Those are challenges. I mean, I'm not going to say that they aren't. And uh, at the same time, we've had really tremendous support from the philanthropic and the corporate support to date. We have had some funding from the city, but we definitely need more. Um, we encourage individuals, if you want, we're a nonprofit. And our, and our goals are big. Um, we wanna have celebrations in a dozen different neighborhoods around the city. Um, maybe these are places where you, where your grandparents were from or where your parents were from. It's an opportunity to go back and celebrate. Reconnect. And reconnect. Um, so if you wanna help us uh, achieve that, you can, you can make a donation on our website, certainly can do that. Um, there are other ways to get involved as well. We have a, we have a pretty tremendous women's committee. Um, I believe in the power of women getting things done. Um, and we've created a women's committee. It's still open and available for people to okay. join. Um, and the membership dollars go to that. will support a legacy project that supports women-owned enterprises in the future. Um, so plenty of ways you can get involved. You mentioned 17, uh, 1976. And for those who are history buffs, they know we kind of, we, we, it was a dud for Philadelphia, let's be yeah. honest. It was during the Rizzo years. Uh, there were some bold plans by the late Edmund Bacon, the city planner, but mm -hmm. they fizzled out and you can you know, list the, the reasons why. What have you learned about your research during that event, the bicentennial that kind of never really happened in Philadelphia? What we've learned is that you have to listen to community. And that's really what we've been doing for a few years now mm -hmm. um, as an organization. And the reason that we took this, uh, we're taking this citywide approach is that people want to be included. 
They want to make money. <laughs> they want to find ways to make money. They want to uh, be recognized for the contributions that they've had in American history in Philadelphia. Um, and they want to create a positive future for their for the children, mm -hmm. for their children, and for the next generation. Um, so the places that we're looking at uh, having some of these celebrations, we, we managed to, we were hoping that we could kick things off at Belmont Mansion and Belmont Plateau. Um, Just the down the street from here. Yes, that's right, right around the corner. Um, at the beginning of the summer of 2026. And then there will be other neighborhood celebrations happening around the city right. in places like um, Historic Germantown, 9th Street Market, uh, Centro de Oro, Chinatown, up in the Northeast at Fox Chase and Mayfair. So the idea really is to amplify and support the neighborhood events that happen there and bring these exciting 250th elements to it as well that um, really will connect those places back to the history. Now I know your organization is primarily focused on the birthday celebration, but I mentioned all these other sporting events and they're big ones. Yes. And so people were like, how are we gonna pull this off? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. It is a lot of stuff. And, and that's why there's a coalition of partners. We're all working together. So the FIFA team is working with us. Um, the well, Wawa Welcome America is gonna be the best um, fireworks and concert show that any of us have seen uh, probably to date ever, right? That'll be fantastic, we're working with them. Um, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, they're gonna have, they're gonna be conventions all over um, at the Convention and Visitors Center, but throughout the whole year of 2026. So we're all working together to make sure that our events are complementary to one another, that uh, we're not on top of each other, and that there's really something that someone could do pretty much every day between May and September. I imagine you could do a different thing in okay. Philadelphia. Whether you like sports, whether you like history, whether you like food or tours, there'll be something you can do. And by the way, I forgot to mention that the Rocky film turns 50. It does. In 2026, so there's a lot of other stuff. I want to get your thought on this. So we had an election. It was contentious, as it was the last one and the one before that. And there is a part of society that is sort of soured yeah. on the thought of democracy. How might this event in 2026 impact that? Yeah, well, I mean, we are the birthplace of American democracy. This is where the Declaration of Independence was signed. That is the anniversary that we're celebrating in, 20, in 2026. Um, it's where the Constitution was signed. So if there is any other city in America that has a responsibility to um, hold fast to those founding ideals of uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and um, making sure that everyone has opportunity to those, act to those it is Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pope Week, they shut the streets down. That was my favorite part. Are you going to do that? I, it's not up to you, but would you like to see that? I'm a big fan of closed streets, so Good to see I hope that. so. <laughs> Danielle DeLeo Kim, President and CEO of the Philadelphia 250. Thanks for joining us, and you will hear a lot more from your organization leading up to 2026. You will. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very we'll much. We'll be right back with our pen. We are back with our Insiders of the Week. Let us meet them all. We have Brian Tierney of Brian Communications. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Former Common Pleas Court Judge Nelson Diaz. Oh, it's great to be with you, Matt. Thank you, Your Honor. A.J. Raju of Raju LLP. Hello, A.J. Good morning. And Farah Jimenez, President of the Philadelphia Education Fund. Good morning. Good morning, Farah. All right, so are we ready for 2026? And, and by, by the way, uh, I interviewed Governor Shapiro for the um, Philadelphia, Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce. They wanted me to talk to him about this. And basically, like, I hope we don't screw it up. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah. we want this to be big. Yeah, and, and this is the face of Philadelphia we're putting on in a couple of years. And you're talking about democracy, and you're talking about the shrine of democracy, which is Philadelphia. And if we can basically debate and work on that, and hopefully we still have a democracy in 2026, that'll be a great <laughs> topic to be able to push. Also, you know, with these things become with, you know, the World Cup and, and 2026 and all these other things going on, it's a chance to really raise the profile of Philadelphia on an international stage and the benefits come back for decades, to, you know, down the road too with travel and tourism and all the rest. There is a certain sense of excitement, but also there's a certain sense in the business community of we've supported it. Is this really going to, you know, what's the city going to do? There's a certain tentativeness I, I detect sometimes when I talk to people. It's in the too close here. from now, but it's also too far away. It, it, yeah, but way. it's also like, what's the, is this really going to come together? Like, can we, and I think it's great the role that she's playing too, which is reassuring people, mm -hmm. outreach, but I think they're also saying, what kind of checks are we going to get from government to make sure these things can really work? We did Pope Week. Yep. Yeah. We were deeply involved with that. Yep. 
But it was really important when you posed the um, question uh, to the present CEO of, Ameri of Philadelphia 250 is about all the layering events that are all happening. Mm -hmm. Not only are they all happening in 2026, they're all basically happening in July. Um, and so one of the, uh, I think the undercurrents here is the question around SEPTA. If you're going to be transporting, moving all these people around, we're, I know we're focusing a lot on lodging and housing. Will we have enough rooms? <coughs> but we're also going to have to move those people yeah, around. Right. Bad time and, for them to be and in a quote unquote death spiral. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so I wonder if SEPTA will take this as an <coughs> opportunity to again elevate the conversation around the need for sustained funding yeah, because one otherwise things, it's going to yeah. undermine get, the one of the things. Presents. One of the things about the, let me. One of the things about is this is a walkable city, yeah. which is unique. To, uh, many they might close cities. the streets down like they did yeah. Pope Week. So yeah. that's really a benefit that we have if SEPTA uh, decides not to be a participant. Yeah. And, and the man of optimism? No, no, it, it's like a garage sale. You neighbors get to see what you have inside. Uh, so are we a mausoleum of past accomplishments or a factory of future innovation? I think it's a combination of both. Obviously, all the things you guys said, but also Penn Medicine, all the things that we're doing in translational research. Uh, cell and gene therapy. I mean, that's what I think it should be about, yeah. about the future. Yeah, well, we'll be hearing more from Danielle and her organization throughout these next, you know, it's basically 14 months away. Amazing. That's not uh, a long time. Yeah, no. the Casey dynasty has officially been broken. Democratic Senator Bob Casey admitted late Thursday night he does not have the votes to win the recount and conceded his race. Republican Dave McCormick, who lost a bid to run for the U.S. Senate in 2022, who declared victory in this race shortly after Election Day, becomes the state's newest U.S. Senator in January. Casey, the son of a former governor, served the public for 28 years as Auditor General and Treasurer of Pennsylvania and will conclude his third term in the U.S. Senate in January. So potluck of questions here for you guys. How did Casey lose? What might Casey do now? And what type of role might McCormick find as himself being the new guy in Washington? Pick I'll, one. I'll, I'll start with Casey, first of all, it, it's a shame because he was a common sense, practical, let's find the middle ground kind of a Democratic voice and as, as, as a U.S. Senator, so that's a real loss. McCormick, I think, won because in a surprising way, people that you never thought would vote Republican voted Republican. I mean, you're seeing numbers changing, you know, Biden won this area by 15 vote and Trump wound up flipping it and winning by five points the other way so a 19 point swings I mean it was pretty amazing and I think in the end that's mm -hmm. what I think another reason by following your chain of thought is the fact that we had a, a lower turnout in Philadelphia that mm -hmm. was expected and as you know the election was so close between McCormick and him um, I hate to see him go because he's been a great statesman I've known his whole family all of these years they don't have a, a bad bone in their in their body, and so it's sad to see the end of an era. What you said about Philadelphia, Nelson, uh, the Philadelphia City Commissioner Lisa Daly said that 36,604 Philadelphia voters undervoted, which means they voted for president when it came to the Senate race, which is number two on the ballot. Right. They didn't put anything there; they skipped it over. Why do Why do you think people did that? 36,000 people. I think a lot of people pay attention to what's happening at the very, very top of the ticket and not as much often to what's happening below. Mm -hmm. And even though we think it's a significant race, the oxygen was all consumed by the presidential race. Um, I think even on Inside Story, we didn't give a lot of time actually to the Senate races either because there was so much th of interest with all the changes and who was going to be the Democratic candidate. Um, I, I think the story here, it's not just that Casey lost, but it is that Dave McCormick won. He was in the Philadelphia region almost every week. Yeah, he was yeah. meeting robustly with the Jewish community. He went to Israel. He showed his commitment um, to international concerns. He has a st strong record of being um, really smart and involved in um, prior administrations, but also understanding finance. And his secret weapon really is his wife, Dina, who was yes. part of- There is um, one of his top advisors. Right, yeah. one of his top advisors, but also she was, the key, to the Abraham, she was the key to the Abraham Accords. I mean, she yeah. is incredible. And I would say the other thing that was key is the fact that uh, there was unification in the Republican Party. Mm. There was not a primary contest from the beginning, yeah. Pennsylvania Much different and nationally. Yeah. They were all in for Dave McCormick. Yeah. What, what do you think Casey's role may be? Is he going to be the elder statesman of the Democratic well, Party, or uh, may he have a comeback in store? Because he's 64 years old. I don't know if there's a comeback that way. He's known for civility. Um, I think more like Mitt Romney. <coughs> You know, I don't know, actually. I, I, I'm, I'm lost on what his... I mean, his, his party may be a bit different from where he no, started I, as a I, politician. I think right now with the Democratic Party, you have multiple factions that are going to try to find out what the soul of the party is. 
And could he play the role of a Mitt Romney that tries to bring uh, the fissures and, and seal it together? That could be a role. But, you know, known for civility, known for politeness, but I don't think uh, known for big accomplishments in terms of what he brought to Pennsylvania, not like the typical lines of sen other Senate, well, Massachusetts and other states we can point to. I think that moving forward, hopefully McCormick can bring some things uh, to Pennsylvania that would be helpful for but us. But you know, Casey doesn't have as much money as you do, and so to <laughs> some extent, <laughs> it would be an opportunity for I him. I still rent my suits from Blockbuster, <laughs> by the <laughs> way. <laughs> he, he still has an opportunity, essentially, to make a living. Um, the Casey family <coughs> has never been about money. Yeah. Uh, they've always been true. about public service, and to some extent, Long it's an opportunity for him to be able to at least have enough fun so that he can retire. He never went the influencer route. That's no, so but I think, I think not, I'm not talking about what he can do personally. I'm talking about what he can do as an influence in a nation right now that is so divided, where there's so much lack of civility. Here's a man, mm -hmm. similar to Mitt Romney, what I'm saying is it's a throwback to when people spoke with civility. They had integrity. Mm -hmm. I think Casey some, uh, embodies all of those things. Yeah, but I, 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 I unfortunately Mitt Romney has not been respected within the, his own party, even though we respect him yeah. on he the other side. I would just and the question is, can he be respected within his own party in terms of being able to be that You way? just articulated my point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so I would buy into that were it not for how he conducted this race, where he, I think Senator Casey uh, showed the most negative aspects of the race, trying to um, malign Dave McCormick in a way that was very personal and often um, misinformation, we want to use that language. But then in addition, the way that he exited the stage as well. I think bringing in Mark Elias, who is known as somebody who finds votes, the system and then, is that way. And then, yeah. and then having the, yeah. um, the issues that occurred in Bucks County where, and in Philadelphia County where you had an attempt by some of the commissioners <coughs> to actually count votes um, that were not legitimate and viewed by a democratically controlled Pennsylvania Supreme Court is not legitimate to be counted. And the reckoning all of for that, that may not be right, over. All, all of that, I think, undermines so his you know, brand. It's that clo I don't think it does. I, I, I think him leaving <coughs> the stage the way he did, I, I think his brand is, is a good one, especially in a Democratic Party, which is way over here. Mm -hmm. He has a strong voice of, you know, I, I hearken back when I, my first job out of college, I got a job with, working in the Reagan administration. And that imagery of Ronald Reagan inviting Tip O'Neill to the White House to have a beer and let's try to find the common ground. I mean, that's what we need, and I think. I agree. Well, that's but on the, on the that's question, on the question that yeah. Matt talked about in terms of the votes, it really is Tom Wolf's legacy, which he changed the process that allowed the process to be changed, where you could put one lever and vote totally down the Democratic line. Now mm -hmm. you have to vote Everyone. each one, and I think that's part of what we lost with regard to Casey because he couldn't get the benefit of the top lever. Dr. Mehmet Oz joining the administration as the uh, head of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Another sort of local person, Howard Lutnick, uh, who has he went to Haverford uh, yeah, University, uh, Haverford College, uh, has been chosen to lead the Commerce Department. Uh, reaction to these picks, I mean, where do they fall on the, the Gates to Rubio scale of, of picks with the Trump administration, which is a wide Oh region. my gosh, Th these guys are, you know, you, you, anybody who was nominated for, for these spots, you, you could find reasons to criticize. But, I mean, Robert F. Kennedy, Gates, <laughs> I mean, these are the crazy, so luckily, I mean, I knew people who were close to Trump with the nomination of Gates themselves before he stepped down were like, gosh, I really love Trump, but this is a, this is a crazy <laughs> pick. I don't get it. I don't get it. So I, I think Lutnick and those people are kind of, I don't know, or maybe just by comparison, they're not crazy because co the other ones were totally crazy. There goes the Overton window again. But uh -huh. you remember Lutnick was, was selected first for the Treasury, <coughs> and there was that controversy within it. He put him in commerce. It's tough to argue that, yeah. that but they're uh, not competent. But I mean, but yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, yeah, yeah, the they're billionaires. They're competent, but they're competent. Rubio. They're competent for you because they're into the uh, Bitcoin issue mm. pretty much more than anything else. But it's not a question of competency. It's a question of who he wants and his loyalty. It's not a basic, uh, you know, people Everyone assume, uh, people assume <laughs> that when you get elected president, you got the spoil system. You can take whoever you want to take. Yeah. And you got the uh, approval of the Senate, but some people are totally have a troubled time. The Gates issue was they were going to subpoena the issue in the House, and mm -hmm. the FBI has a right to get part of that, and that would have been part 
of the discussion, and the woman was going to testify. Were we so going to say? I, I was going to say you. that all. The, <laughs> all the, it's great when we have local people or people who have a local um, connection who mm -hmm. are appointed into the federal government at, at, in these um, positions of power because it does allow us quicker access when there are issues that concern, I think, our, our state and our region. Um, what I will say, agreeing with AJ, that Lutnick is um, highly regarded. He's the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald, an important investment house. It is an incredibly important position. It's an opportunity for him to weigh in on this question of tariffs, if people are concerned about the economic consequences right. of tariffs. He's somebody who understands investments. He understands the international context of investments, and I think it's a great selection. Mehmet Oz doesn't have as much experience running a sizable organization, but I think what you're seeing is that Donald Trump is selecting people that he views as keyed into him, loyal and supportive of him because he did go the other route last time in 2016, appointing people who were viewed as competent and having risen within or close approximate to those um, agencies. And then he found himself battling with them sure. all the time and, and not feeling like, yeah. Right. And so I think he wants close in. And it could be really interesting what that might reveal of some well, of these agencies. You, met, you <laughs> mentioned the tariffs, Farah. Mm -hmm. So President-elect Trump plans to enact punishing tariffs on foreign imports particularly those on China, up to 60%, the number that he has given. And some people are buying stuff or planning mm -hmm. on it. We're talking about iPhones, kitchen appliances, groceries and cars, because <coughs> they are worried about what economists are saying, that this is going to create a new wave of inflation. What should these people do? Well, they're I, I, absolutely right to be buying right now. If the, what they're mostly concerned about is price, <coughs> the prices will go up. But the other thing to be concerned about is national security. And a lot of these tariffs are about the fact that China has stolen a lot of intellectual property from the United States. We are almost beholden to them on many technologies. We have to therefore kowtow to some of their national security interests or their national international interests. Um, I also think it is frustrating if you're someone like me who is constantly looking for products that are made in the United States because you're hopeful that you're continuing to generate your own economy and keep those jobs within your, buy your within, new, uh, and you can't buy, buy a light bulb. Now. Yeah, yeah. Is, is it worth it, AJ, to, to enact buyer. the tariffs to try and maybe somehow coax manufacturing back here and, and have more ownership of these products? Long term, yes. Short term, they'll be paying 80 percent or so of your products, whether you use electronics or uh, clothing, et cetera, are imported. I'm surprised are, it's not higher than that. Well, we're highly linked to China, India, Vietnam, and others for our supply chain. Mm -hmm. You saw that during the pandemic. So it is a national risk where we need to deleverage. We need to onshore manufacturing up here. Yes, short term uh, pain, long term. Well, let, me let, let, let me give you another story on that. There are already, let's not forget, I mean, under President Biden, there have been tariffs on yeah. solar panels and other sure. things like this. He carried the, to slow the down policies the, the, of the yeah, China. Let me, another story on that. Ten is, seconds. Ten yeah, seconds. Another story is I don't know if Mexico is the biggest trading partner. Yes, it is. He's going to use this to say, Mexico, are you going to stop the immigration or not? And we will uh -huh. either work on the tariff or not. And he's Terrorist a negotiator. Yeah. He's a negotiator. We'll be right back. Wait, one more thing. A.J. Raju has a new edition of Overheard. You can see it on 6abc.com slash overheard, and you sit down with Dr. Robert Vonderheide, the director of the Abraham Cancer Center at Penn Medicine. Real quick, what'd you talk about? Well, I mean, he's the Oppenheimer of uh, Penn Medicine. He leads all of the greatest cancer researchers. Uh, and you talk about future Penn Medicine, number one in translational research. We as a city are number four in the country in cell and gene therapy because of guys like Bob Vonderheide. Yeah, I encourage you to watch many of the other episodes you've done to you talk to some fascinating people and I think I'm stopping by in a couple of weeks. You are, you are. I, what are we going to talk I, about? I never talk about who the guests are so you just I you just spilled spoiled the beans. It. Yeah, you did. You did. Look, we, we have to do the show all over again. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. We got to go. We'll thank you guys that. and thank you to the director of Philadelphia 250. I'm Matt O'Donnell. See you later.